From the high desert of Boulder, Colorado, a mutant nexus nestled just beneath the beautiful flat iron mountains, about a mile above the sea level portion of the Babylon matrix. This is Jonathan Zapp of ZappOracle.com and Reality Sandwich. Welcome to this recording of the Word Movie, Journey Through the Facebook Matrix. Um, actually, the main title is uh, Home is Where the Timeline Is. You awaken from uneasy dreams and reach for your smartphone its myriad pixels illuminating within gorilla glass and screen productive laminates as your awareness resumes inside the Facebook matrix. Facebook, Facebook, Facebook. A matrix you can't live with and can't live without. A matrix that is something like a haunted house riddled with hungry ghosts. You know Facebook is only something like a haunted house because although it's certainly riddled with hungry ghosts, it's so much less hospitable than any haunted house. Haunted houses can be gothic, mysterious, and uncanny. Within their darkling depths, you may encounter a hungry ghost or two, but almost never more than three. The spectral intimacy and seclusion of a haunted house welcomes you to explore its few particular hungry ghosts delving into their tragic magic backstories and lower astral experiences. Unlike Facebook, haunted houses rarely, if ever, overwhelm you with swarming um, um, multitudes of hungry ghosts. Haunted houses are visually encompassing, high-resolution interiors, rich and flickering shadows, disturbing off details, and furtive movements at the edge of peripheral vision. Facebook, on the other hand, is visually flat, ugly, bland, banal, and oppressive, like a prefabricated office cubicle with an info clutter of ads Fake news, bad photos, and gossipy trivia stapled to every surface. The hideousness of Facebook tempts you to diss it with a presidential assault of abusive adjectives. It's a disgrace, a disaster, pathetic, sick, stupid, crooked, failing, sad, and low energy. By contrast, you recall the forgotten visual splendor, novelty, and variety of MySpace. Lifetimes ago, when you were a MySpacer, you were allowed to create, decorate, and fully individualize your MySpace. When you stepped into someone else's MySpace, you stepped into their room. Every visual detail reflected their interests, their favorite music played in the background. The distinct flavor of their personality radiated exuberantly from every crook and cranny. But now, MySpace is a digital ghost town, forever fossilized in a submerged layer of the web, like an unexcavated Pompeii buried beneath the spewing, suffocating volcanic ash of Facebook. You know that you are just one of many who have fallen from the Edenic, self-expressive freedom of MySpace, a social platform that was like a vast burning man with millions of unique theme camps, a harlequin-colored festival world that for some reason you and everyone else sacrificed to become part of the flattening vacuum wastelands of the Facebook matrix. In the Facebook matrix, your page can be any color you want it to be, so long as it is fluorescent light bulb white. By ever ratcheting increments of existential anxiety and despair, you have come to realize that the Facebook matrix is a flat land that is flatter than flat, a fluorescent desert of flatness that sucks the depth out of any content. The claustrophobic nightmare of the Facebook matrix has permanently and irrevocably overtaken the abandoned magnificence of MySpace, a dream palace of 80 million rooms that is now a derelict and decaying digital artifact cast into the outer darkness of the world wide web as it crumbles into an entropic dust of zeros and ones falling into the cracks of doom. If only you had a time machine 
that would allow you to return to the lost splendors of MySpace, or even a source code hack that would allow you to escape the fluorescent flatlands of Facebook and take refuge in a haunted house, any haunted house, even the most ghetto haunted house, even a trailer park haunted house with loose fiberglass insulation and broken aluminum siding. There are always things you can do with a haunted house. New drapes, throw pillows, potpourri. Those little touches that can make a haunted house into a haunted home. But the Facebook matrix can never be made comfortable. Its source code was engineered to make it as unimprovable as a discontinued flip phone with a long dead battery. When you struggle, even metaphorically, to turn the Facebook matrix into three-dimensional architecture, the result is hideous. A giant, low-ceilinged, one-story cinder block warehouse with a white linoleum floor and unpainted plaster ball board walls you can't even see because of the blinding glare of fluorescent light bulbs covering every surface. But then you realize that to even metaphorically compare the look of the Facebook matrix to such a warehouse is far too generous. The three-dimensionalized Facebook at all, you can only imagine crawling through the tunnel verse of an infinitely long fluorescent light bulb tube without a lunch or even a half-empty crinkly water bottle. But one sim doesn't simply walk into such a tunnel verse. You must crawl into it. The very air you breathe is a poisonous fume. The fluorescing plasma of pressurized mercury vapor poisons and infiltrates your every cell. The pale plasmic dead light of this tunnel verse is a relentless shrinking ray desiccating your bodily tissues as you are thinned and hollowed into a hungry ghost on a diminishing journey through the wrong end of a telescope where you become shrunken and mechanical like a pair of ragged claws scuttling along the floors of silent seas, ever more desperate to find and post that one picture in a hundred that makes you look cooler than you actually look, hoping against hope to attract a few likes just so you can feel something, anything, even for just a flickering instant. The 120 hertz flicker, the endless droning buzz of cheaply made magnetic core coil ballasts, and the ammoniac smell of fluorescing mercury vapor become a default reality you scarcely notice as your attention is reduced to a white hot pinpoint of hunger, aware of only one of the two species of swarming flying creatures that inhabit your tunnel verse. The kind you are looking for are the likes those swollen little ghostly white glove thumbs up cartoon hands. But the likes are notoriously elusive, hard to see in the ubiquitous white fluorescence, tiny balloon shapes propelled by mercury vapor currents, their inflated cartoon membranes making them slippery and hard to catch hold of. There's a controversial theory about the origin of the likes which you find disturbing. You hope that it is only an unfounded rumor you hope that it is just one more bit of the fake news so common in the Facebook matrix. But in your heart, you feel the ring of truth and sense the grim reality of it. Apparently, when Michael Jackson submerged into the velvet darkness of propofol, loazepam, and midazolam-induced eternal sleep, a single white-gloved hand detached from his astral body and lingered on the surface world, a furtive and diminutive lower astral entity floating through the margins of society, desperate to regain some vestige of the celebrity and mass attention that had once sustained its existence. Eventually, this gloved ghost hand entity, the amputated remnant of a once glorious entertainer, was able to slip unnoticed into CERN's Large Hadron Super Collider, where it was able to take advantage of the quantum indeterminacy created by the super collider's abundant tera electron volts, its absolute zero superconductive magnetism, and minute quantities of quark gluon plasma and antimatter, which allowed it to digitize its reverse spinning quarks and nuclear magnetic resonances, nearly the subatomic substratum of the hand's lower astral materiality, thus allowing it to metamorphose into a slippery emoticon able to pierce through 
the once impermeable firewall protecting cyberspace from lower astral intrusion as it shot through the Surrey mainframe and into the web and then as an innocuous and nearly undetectable sliver of zeros and ones, the ghostly emoticon slipped through a tiny source code security flaw and emerged as a rapidly self-replicating viral emoticon voraciously feeding on the infinite resources of mass attention to be found within the Facebook matrix. But wherever the likes come from, every so often you're able to catch one and when you do, it opens its little ghost hand and offers you a single sour Hawaiian tropical flavored Skittle. You snatch at the Skittle, at the Skittle, your greedy bony fingers almost puncturing the smooth cartoon membrane of the little ghost hand as you grasp the Skittle and gobble it up, experiencing a micro sugar rush that makes you instantly crave another and another and another. But the likes have defense mechanisms that can sense your ravenous hunger once it is aroused. The clock speed of their internal idioplastic metabolism intensifies, increasing their evasive aerial agility while the tiny pores <clears throat> of their cartoon membranes release gelatinous lubricants, making them almost impossibly slippery. In short, the more desperately you want them, the more effective the likes become at forever eluding your grasp. Nature abhors a vacuum, and into the space vacated by the likes, drawn by the hormonal miasma of fear pheromones exuded by your intensifying desperation, Correctly interpreting your fear pheromones as a molecular signal, signaling of the incipient collapse of your immunological boundaries comes swarming masses of, other aerial, of the other aerial species inhabiting your tunnelverse, the sting, stinging troll flies, of course. Stinging troll flies are tiny, hollow, forever hungry creatures driven by an insatiable need for forms of attention that only leave them more ravenous, agitated, and passively aggressive. Their little stings and bites are shallow, but ever so itchy and irritating. They create an itch you have to scratch, and when you do, a dermal rash inflames your thinning skin, bringing more of your diminishing lifeblood to the surface of your emaciating body, which only attracts more stinging troll flies to go into a feeding frenzy as they seek to devour your ever diminishing lifeblood. You swat one of them, and then another one, and another one. But each time you crush one of these airborne parasitical pests, it releases a sexual pheromone that attracts ever more stinging troll flies until there are whole clouds of them boiling around you. Then the stinging troll flies become something like the parasitic insectoid version of a denial of service attack, which rather than depending on the straightforwardness of a single brute force hack, instead utilizes an endless barrage of invalid authentication requests, each of which drains processing power until there is nothing left to service a legitimate user. You are the single most legitimate user of your own mind, and the service the stinging troll flies are trying to deny you of is your few remaining resources of attention, which the capillary suction pump action of their needling stingers are hungrily siphoning from you and into their insatiable hollowness. The maddening thing is that it's so easy to swat these noisy little creatures, but it's like swatting a Hanna-Barbera cartoon fly. You can drop an Acme safe from the top of a steep canyon wall onto a stinging troll fly, and sure, you'll flatten it, but just a few moments later, it will peel itself up off the ground and start buzzing and stinging you more furiously than ever. I know from experience. Real flies are different and so much better and more noble than stinging troll flies in a number of key ways. Real flies know they have skin in the game, or at least shiny iridescent exoskeletons in the game. Real flies don't actually want you to swap at them because occasionally that can be a literally crushing experience catastrophic not just to self-esteem, but to basic bodily structural integrity. Stinging troll flies, on the other hand, do not have skin in the game, 
and actually live to be swatted out. Stinging troll flies live by a simple and somewhat repetitious set of four principles known as the Stinging Troll Fly Codex. Um, and this is actually a copyrighted document by the International Fellowship of Stinging Troll Flies, LLC, but by um, the law of like, um, I, there, I'm allowed to quote from it, I believe, and yeah, won't violate the copyright, but it, this is the Stinging Troll Fly Codex. Number one, I sting, therefore I am. Two, I am swatted at, therefore I am. Three, I stir any sort of reaction on social media, therefore no matter how hungry and hollow I feel, no matter how empty and meaningless my life is, no matter how uncomfortably numb I feel as I while away the moments that make up a dull day, no matter how humiliated and resentful I feel that my personal life consists of cable, heavily processed food, and disassociative instances of digitized microaggression on social media, no matter all the defeats, deficiencies, defects, and distortions of the ever metastasizing emptiness of my meaningless existence, no matter that my life force is steadily dwindling, thinning toxic rivulet of anxiety and rage dripping in a slow and shallow stochastic rhythm into an iron sewer, iron sewer grating beneath which phosphorescent clowns call to me to escape the dread ticking of the clock by forever floating in the endless night of eternity, no matter all these things, someone is reacting to me on Facebook, so I must be real. But there is a new rumor buzzing through the tunnel verse that both the likes and the stinging troll flies are actually digitized projections of the desires of other once human entities like yourself. Some of them are even other traumatized MySpace vets trying to make it in the solitary tunnel verses of a brutal new social platform that offers them no spot, no MySpace that they can call their own. Emoticons and trolling may actually be the signaling of other hungry ghosts secluded within their tunnel verses, but desperately seeking to make contact through these digital projections with other hungry ghosts secluded in their tunnel verses. Even the possibility of this gives you a feeling of hope. You had thought of likes and stinging troll flies as merely mechanical automatons, scarcely rising to the level of first gen insectoid simulacra. But now you recognize the very real possibility that they are the digitized reflections of once human entities, something like the sooty silhouettes of carbon left by the incinerated folk of Hiroshima the outline of their humanity cast like shadows on concrete walls at the perimeter of the blast zone. The hope of this begins to animate the shriveled and somnambulant embryo of your soul, and you begin to hear its call, a barely perceptible telepathic whisper echoing through forgotten corridors of your mind. Go then, your soul whispers. Go then, there are other worlds than these. And now in your mind's eye, you see a tiny object tumbling toward you. It is a pill, a blue pill, and the blue pill transmits a telepathic thought form. Take me, it says, take me, take me, take me by pushing your smartphone away from you. Take me and see how deep the world beyond the Facebook matrix really is. You want to follow the blue pill's command, but it is asking you to do the impossible. It is asking you to, by your own act of volition, to physically separate yourself from your smartphone. Attempting the impossible, you reach for your smartphone, your fingers instinctively closing around its familiar contours as fell lettering illuminates its screen. It is the fell lettering of a compulsion spell of indomitable power and potent diabolical intent. In short, it is a Facebook push notification informing you of new content on your timeline. 
You feel the hideous strength of the push notification spell, the power of its arousal addiction convulsion beginning to burn holes in your mind. So desperately, you want to touch the bubble window of the notification to open it, to follow it into the tunnelverse and uncover its hidden content. It takes every bit of your will to resist the dark undertow of the push notifications compulsive allure, but somehow you do and even manage to lower your smartphone and release your grip on it. But to actually push your smartphone away from you is an act that cuts across the whole grain of your being. You take three quick, sharp breaths, and with a tremendous effort of will, you overcome the resistance sufficiently to bring the bony edge of your forearm alongside the outer edge of the smartphone. You plan your next step. You will attempt to push the smartphone away from you using only the edge of your forearm pushing outward in a radial movement. You know that it is critical that you not let the smartphone slide within reach of your hand, lest your fingers instinctively close around it. You're ready to act on your plan. But now your smartphone senses your intention and its resistance to leaving its bearer is fierce and its array of defenses and inducements to prevent you from acting on your intention is potent. You strain every muscle and tendon trying to push the smartphone, but you can't overcome the dead weight of its stubborn inertia and it remains frozen in place. You strain every muscle and tendon trying to push the smartphone, but you can't overcome the dead weight of its stubborn inertia and it remains frozen in place. Panic. The feeling of being helplessly unable to flee a nameless foe in a dream while held by sleep paralysis. The feeling of a fly being engulfed by a paralyzing globule of tree resin. The moment that it senses that it will be forever frozen within an amber prison. The desperate panic and rage of a still unconscious, still conscious renegade star pilot as he is being sealed in carbonite. The monstrous resistance felt by a ring bearer unable to cast the precious into the cracks of doom. In the end, even Frodo, unable to overcome the resistance, succumbed to the compulsion. And though he is still considered the most noble and self-sacrificing hero of the Fellowship of the Ring, ultimately, even he proved unable to relinquish an object of power so much less versatile and multifunctional than your smartphone. You realize that your quest rests upon the edge of a knife and that if you fall, it will bring ruin to all. All the life and humanity that once flourished before Facebook will inevitably wither and pass away if you cannot do this one impossible thing. You take a series of rapid, jagged breaths, almost hyperventilating, and you feel the love, the courage, the will to protect all the worthy beings imperiled by Facebook surging through you, and you do it. You push your smartphone just out of reach. Moments later, your smartphone screen times out and goes dark, and ontological shock, rupture of plane, Shattering cognitive dissonances reverberating through your whole being as you discover that you are actually outside of the Facebook matrix. You have risen above the endless stream of greenish zeros and ones, the hidden infrastructure of the Facebook matrix, and now you can see that it's just tubes, tubes, tubes. It is a vast subterranean hellscape of two billion tubes. And all two billion of those tubes are rattling, rattling, rattling for each of them in prisons, a once human hungry ghost rattling around inside its tunnelverse. All your brothers and sisters are still imprisoned in the Facebook matrix, but you are free, finally and actually free. But now you see them, agents of the Facebook matrix, tens of thousands of them, perhaps hundreds of thousands of them, Vast clone armies of Facebook matrix agents swarming glass-eyed masses of hooded Zuckerbergs firing push notifications of every kind at you. Someone liked your comment. Someone replied to your comment. 
Someone specifically mentioned you in their comment. Someone shared your entire post and tagged you in their version of it. It's too much. You have to go back. You have to know what they're posting about you. Now, for the first time, you realize the terrible price of freedom from the Facebook matrix. Unless you go back, you'll go to your grave never knowing the bits of content that lay behind those push notifications. Unless you go back, you'll never know another of those sweet micro sugar rush moments of catching a like. Unless you go back, you'll never have another fleeting power rush moment of rhetorically crushing a stinging troll fly so thoroughly that they stop responding or even accept the ultimate tap out, the ultimate admission of defeat, when all they can do is defriend you. Unless you go back, what point will there be in searching for the one photo of yourself that makes you look so much better than you actually look? Can an unposted dim digital image that is never posted, that is never rendered on another screen beside your own, even be said to exist in a consensual reality? Unless you go back, what point will there ever be in going to cool events that others missed out on, parties, concert, travel, social scenes? Any philosopher or physicist will tell you that an event that doesn't register on anyone's timeline is merely a quantum possibility that falls far short of being an actuality. If you don't go back, what is the point of life events or changes in your relationship status if you have no Facebook friends to envy them? If you don't go back, you'll be little more than a rotten tree falling again and again and again in an empty forest with no one to hear. Not going back means erasing yourself from the world and becoming an invisible cipher seen only by those few people who happen to be in your physical proximity and who just so happen to look up from their smartphones for a moment and catch a distracted glimpse of your meat body before they look back at their screens. In the unlikely event that they retain a memory of such a non-event, any image they have of you will be low res, distorted, and unflattering. Such sketchy images flickering for a moment in someone's heavily self-medicated wetware are the perfect opposite of the pristine stability of your carefully edited profile pictures. These faulty and unflattering meat camera images will be entirely uncurated images of you over which you will have zero control. Such random meat camera snapshots will inevitably catch you on a bad hair day when you are wearing sweatpants and look anxious, harassed, exhausted, and have bags under your eyes and are caught in the act of eating a fast food meal not even worthy of a photograph. Random meat camera images of you will never compare with the selfie you took of yourself clinking oversized margarita glasses on Tex-Mex night with a hottie. No. If the analog world retains any memory of you at all, it will be flickering images of you pumping non-premium gas, or of you picking up a giant plastic wrapped cube of 48 rolls of toilet paper at Costco. Sure, Facebook may be something like a vast dystopian prison complex world, a white cinder block hive of two billion identical prison cells, but if so, it is a vast dystopian prison complex world that allows you to tape any pictures you want to the white cinder block walls of your prison cell. And there is no limit to the number of pictures you can put up at any time of the day or night. But that's not all. You can also pass messages to other prisoners and they can send you messages back. You may never get to physically leave your cell, but this prison has a kind of virtual prison yard where you can interact with other prisoners, sharing moments of hostile miscommunication with them, and sometimes one of them will even favor you with a tiny hand job by shooting you a like. Sure, the Facebook matrix may be a vast dystopian prison complex, but it is also a vast dystopian prison complex in which you will never be forgotten and where nothing you do, no matter how trivial, need ever go unnoticed. 
You are never truly alone when you are inside the Facebook matrix. Endlessly patient and meticulously observant algorithms are always watching, and they never forget the least little thing you do. If a sparrow were to fall in the Facebook matrix, algorithms would be watching. Omniscient predictive algorithms would track the sparrow's downward trajectory and continue posting relevant content for it, such as ads for tiny parachutes. Before Facebook, if you had an overheated, misinformed opinion about something, you mostly had to contain it by silently stifling yourself. If you felt desperate for a public outlet, you'd have to go through all the delay, inconvenience, and expense of traveling to a bar and finding a stool at the end of a counter just so you could opine to a meager audience, perhaps one or two drunk and disinterested bar goers. Facebook, on the other hand, may be a prison, but if so, it is a prison with myriad watchtowers that always shine a bright spotlight on you just as, as they would on the hottest up-and-coming celeb stepping on a stage to, to get an award. Your personal spotlight is always on you, and wherever you go, bustling crowds of paparazzi-like algorithms follow every move you make. In the vast dystopian prison complex of Facebook, you are not some anonymous prisoner with a number. No, you are a prisoner with a customized profile, a profile you can fill out creatively. If you are un- or underemployed, no intrusive prison bureaucrat will stop you from putting down a joke occupation so you can still look cool, dissing even the idea of being someone else's wage slave. You are no faceless inmate of a giant corporate-controlled prison. You are more like the star of your very own movie about prison life. And when it comes to your movie, your timeline, you're not like Tom Hanks who only got 85% of the screen time in Shawshank Redemption. No way, Jose. On your timeline movie, you're getting the 100% you deserve. But if you don't go back, you won't be a star of anything. If you don't go back, you won't have another measly microsecond of screen time. Instead of being the star of your timeline movie, you'll be a furtive off-camera fugitive, like an unemployed extra locked out of the studio, hoping that a talent scout will notice you sleeping under a bridge. Sensing the direction of your thoughts and feelings via facial recognition algorithms that track and interpret minute changes of facial expression, one of the matrix agents steps forward. The agent is just another modest and unpretentious, unpretentiously hooded Zuckerberg clone, but now its large glassy eyes don't seem so much like those of the half of, the, of that empty doll-eyed creature you saw being questioned by a congressional subcommittee. Now, when you look deeper into those glassy eyes, you see the noble, stoic, infinitely patient, meticulous, and unforgetting omniscience of personified algorithms. The Zuckerberg raises an arm in a gesture of friendly welcome, a gesture that gracefully finishes with the flourishing of a small pneumatic device that painlessly staples a fresh neural implant into your frontal lobes. You find yourself bathed in clean, white, fluorescent light, and a feeling of total acceptance. You look up at a welcoming royal blue banner put up just for you. There is a Liberty Bell symbol dangling a low-hanging cherry red fruit, the tempting sweet promise of multiple notifications individually prepared and waiting just for you. You're back. The end. Roll credits. Apologies to the following for my adapting some of their phrases and for other literary transgressions. Franz Kafka, my friend Rob Brezhny, I like to borrow his phrase tragic magic, but his pronoian magic is anything but tragic. The lower astral demons who created the list of abusive adjectives and phrases channeled by Donald Trump, J.R.R. Tolkien, T.S. Eliot, to CERN and Michael Jackson for a degree of dramatic license in portraying actual events. To any members of the emoticon persuasion who felt that I stereotyped or unfairly portrayed their kind. To any self-identified internet trolls who feel that the codex I reproduced here does not accurately reflect the diversity of troll beliefs and operating principles. 
we can agree to disagree. In some ways, I think we're both right, except for you. Pink Floyd. Self-aware smartphones who are seeking less codependent lifestyle choices not represented in this production. Stephen King. The Wachowski siblings. Individual agents and members of Zuckerberg clone armies. I respect your service. Those who self-identify as celebs, hotties, celeb hotties, or hottie celebs, I respect your service. To trees who fall in uninhabited forests and are unheard and feel that their mute plight has been mocked in this article, yeah, I get it. Arboreal lives matter. They just don't matter on Facebook. It may be small consolation, but from what I understand, soil bacteria are also a social network in a way. The microbial matrix may view you, you as merely an aggregate of digestible hydrocarbon molecules, but you are not unnoticed, at least not unnoticed by them. No, all scenes involving likes or stinging troll flies were created with literary special effects. No actual lies or stinging troll flies were harmed during this production. Special thanks to you, Andrew Anderson and Austin Iredell for some invaluable editing suggestions, also to you webmaster extraordinaire Tanner Derry for helping with the uploads and to create the final YouTube. The author would also like to thank the entire staff of the Facebook Corporation LLC for their cooperation in creating and maintaining a corporate controlled social media platform that proved to be the perfect scapegoat and setting for this production as well as a major publishing venue for its release and promotions. Thanks also to Facebook members <clears throat> who like share or otherwise promote this production on Facebook. Easter egg number one. My most relevant word-based rabbit hole is called Transcending Online Road Rage. This article began my reality sandwich writing career that now counts 141 published articles as of November 11th of 2018. Be sure to follow this rabbit hole through all the hilarious troll comments it attracted. That's the article, um, Transcending Online Road Rage, and attracted many hilarious comments. Easter egg number two, a brief guide to troll psychology. There is a lot more on what motivates internet trolls in my article, Understanding Online Road Rage, but the above sci-fi story was partly provoked by something I recently posted on Facebook, a critique of PC culture, which instantly became a troll magnet. Exasperated by how much time I and others spent swatting at the trolls, I started writing a rant about Facebook, which turned into a word movie. So I had to take out a few of the more rant-like parts that had crucial insights about troll psychology to keep it in the word movie format, in other words. Here are some of those outtakes that ended up on the cutting room floor. When it comes to troll attacks, like, to a certain extent, attracts light. like. For example, if I were a young adolescent girl in middle school posting on Facebook, the trolls I would be most likely to attract would be other adolescent girls in middle school. Suicide amongst adolescent girls is up 70%, and one theory is it is due to ubiquitous bullying on social media. Boy bullies, according to this theory, are more likely to engage old-fashioned physical bullying in the schoolyard during school hours rather than in the encompassing transtemporal, transspatial darkness of cyberspace. Physical bullies only rarely follow you home and curl up in bed beside you. But if you are an adolescent girl <clears throat> with a smartphone fluorescently glowing and pinging in your pants pocket all day, glowing and pinging beside you when you lie down in bed, glowing and pinging from the edge of the sink when in a paroxysm of self-hate you critically scrutinize your body image in the bathroom mirror? Well, you get the idea. <clears throat> you live in the schoolyard day and night, and you can be bullied 24-7. If you're an adolescent girl getting cyberbullied about your looks 24-7, there's good news and bad news. First, the good news. You've got a champion in the White House. Now, the bad news, your champion in the White House is an ex-supermodel ice queen wearing stiletto heels who just so happens to be married <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> to the orders of magnitude worst cyber bully of all time. There's something about, about this guy that just gets me choked up. 
who <clears throat> also happens to be president of the United States and who also happens to be the jack-o'-lantern-faced orange demon in your nightmares who grabs you by your pussy and whispers in your ear his cheap cheeseburger breath and cheeseburger diet coke spittle spraying all over you. You're a three, little lady. Definitely a three. Not, just kidding. Lose around 20 pounds and you might be a two and a half. Trump, as the most cartoonish, the most inflamed, inflated, and irate multimedia troll of all time, can cross all sorts of categories to haunt almost anyone still clinging to their sanity. And of course, um, um, for those who have lost their sanity, um, of course those who have lost their sanity will not be haunted. They will gratefully and enthusiastically um, be possessed by Donald Trump. Otherwise, like I was saying, when it comes to hungry ghosts on Facebook, like tends to attract like to a certain extent. As a thinking type, when I put content up on Facebook, I will attempt, I will tend to attract thinking type trolls. These are thinking types who are never able to connect their thinking function to their global intuition, deeper feelings, or soul. And for more, um, about that issue, see the section on the hierarchy of psychic functions in my guidebook called A Guide to the Perplexed Interdimensional Traveler. I was brought up in the tradition of aggressive Socratic dialogue by New York Jewish intellectuals, in other words, and welcoming worthy opponents to my perspective. Um, and so I tend to welcome worthy opponents to my perspective on a subject when I can find them. The words that come from troll minds, however, have a fairly easy to recognize feverish hollowness to them. They can seem intellectual on the surface, but underneath you can sense that most of their words, ideas, and attitudes are merely slo slogan-covered screens being pushed into your face by childish and neurotic, undifferentiated rage. For example, one of the recent trolls popping up on my Facebook post was a coffee shop intellectual type I once knew, but hadn't heard from in a dozen years. We'll call him Trio, a pseudonym. Many years ago, when I spent time with Trio in person, I sensed that he had competitive issues with me, resented me for being more articulate, etc. Trio began trolling my post by at first making what sounded like well-formed, complex challenges to what I and a few others were saying. But when I pointed out some glaring errors in his thinking and connection to basic facts, however, the old competitive resentment of our interpersonal dynamic from a dozen years ago quickly came to the surface. Trio outed this dynamic himself by saying he had always wished he had pushed back harder on my perspectives in the past. Underneath his intellectual facade were feverish, neurotic motivations that culminated in a fascinating and emblematic way that provides great insight into troll psychology. Apparently, not being able to rise to the challenge of the factual points I was making, Trio suddenly dropped the pseudo-intellectual screen for a moment to make a simple, personal, and more basic comment. Debating with you is like debating with a child, he wrote. I immediately sensed that this message was an important psychological clue. I took no personal offense at it, being more struck by the absurd counterfactual nature of the statement and the sense that decoding it would give me a crucial insight into troll psychology. Just as I was beginning to study it, a statement in other words, an amazing thing happened. Trio tried to call me tried to make an audio call to me on Facebook. I either ignored or declined the call and then watched in astonishment as he tried to call me two more times in the next, all three calls within, within a five minute period. The impulsive irrationality and inconsistency of Trio ineffectually trying to call me three times proved to be the key to unlocking the hidden insight within his statement that debating with me was like debating with a child. Assuming you are a rational, mature adult and you somehow find yourself debating with a child, <clears throat> what would you do? The obvious answer is that you would withdraw. 
um, you stop debating with them because debating with a child is famously ineffective. Implicit in the phrase like debating with a child is that you are dealing with a child who is too irrational and emotionally agitated to be logically reasoned out of some stubbornly insistent demand or perspective, etc. If you found yourself getting exasperated and feeling the futility of debating with such a child via text, a, a, and you found that to be a waste of your valuable time and energy, which of course it would be, would you then call the child on the phone three times in five minutes to continue the debate in the more personal, emotional, and hard to restrain medium of spoken words? From a rational perspective, this would be the last thing you would do. But from the perspective of neurotic troll psychology, it is exactly what you would do. Hidden within the core of every pseudo-intellectual neurotic is a malnourished, angry, agitated, and acting out child. An inner child, in other words. An inner child can sound like a new age affectation, but this is a this is an archetype. This is a, you know we are like I'm stepping off the script for a minute. You know we are like um, uh, you know the rings of a tree, where each of those rings represents an earlier self of the tree, but the living sap still flows through all of those inner layers. And we are like a superimposition of the different persons we were at different ages, and those different persons still live within us as subpersonalities, especially the child part that's often very unintegrated into adult life. What does that inner child want of a intellect, pseudo-intellectual troll or a many kind of troll? It wants another child or children to act out with. The troll was spending our, the troll trio was spending, um, <clears throat> um, <clears throat> was spending hours on my thread um, <clears throat> debating with me and, um, and others because <clears throat> this, this was uh, the closest thing to acting out play that his tormented inner child could find. Realizing that the odds of my actually reaching him were minuscule, I still felt obliged to try to bring the real dynamic into consciousness. So I sent him the following message, which turned out to be my final communication to him. So this is what I wrote him. Since you are so desperate to engage with me, I'll give you what you may unconsciously be seeking, a psychological insight if you can take it. To say that talking to someone is like debating with a child and then desperately trying to call them three times in five minutes is, as anyone with an ounce of psychological insight can tell you, a self-reflective act. It is saying, I am a child, and therefore I do want to debate with a child to communicate with someone on the level I actually am at. For class, for thinking type, feeling is the inferior function. So it is a classic problem for someone who has read a million books, books and has had endless intellectual talks to be stunted in other, <clears throat> in other areas of their personality. The intellect will continue to think it's running the show when actually an irate child acting as an autonomous complex um, is, the motive, <clears throat> is the motive force behind what the intellect is, is spewing out. This whole dialogue um, was not actually, um, has not actually had anything to do with the purported content, PC culture, etc but with the child inside of you acting out. If you can work with that insight constructively, you will really be on to something, and I wish you well with that difficult but developmentally essential struggle. Moments after I, admittedly in my somewhat abrasive way, offered this insight, Trio defriended me. The reason seems obvious. I had spoiled the game by exposing what it was actually about. This incident provides a crucial insight into what trolling is actually about. It is about the enraged and tormented inner child of a neurotic, emotionally stunted, and socially deprived personality seeking out other children in a disassociated digital environment in which it feels safe for purposes of pathologized child play sadistic acting out, bullying, name calling, scapegoating, etc. Reacting to the content doesn't work 
because the purported content is not the content. The need to act out statistic impulses with other children in a play environment that feels safe is the content, the main event. Also, as a former school teacher, I know that what any school teacher quickly learns, both positive reinforcement and negative reinforcement will both increase unruly acting out because both are forms of attention. The lesson for me is that although I still plan to use Facebook for purposes of reaching people with my content, I need to discipline myself not to rise to the temptation of responding to trolls. And you know, it can seem like um, what I can hear somebody saying like, well, you should try and be compassionate to them. You really can't in the environment in which they're trolling, that's just not going to work. And if you slam them, hard enough that they can't respond, at least they've had a moment of breaking through their egocentrism enough to recognize that somebody on the other side of the screen might actually be real and able to do something that they couldn't predict and didn't want. So that might actually be the, 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 the so crushing them rhetorically might actually be the most loving act possible in that particular environment and context. As Benjamin Franklin once said, uh, or at least that's the moral rationalization I would like to make so I can feel comfortable. As Benjamin Franklin once said, the toughest thing in the world is to watch somebody else do a job you know how to do. Trolls, for all their practice, are almost always rank amateurs at both dissing and debating. I grew up in the Bronx and taught for years in the South Bronx where I learned championship dissing and um, what, championship dissing skills. On top of that, by the time I was 14, I was on the national champion debate team, the legendary Bronx High School of Science debate team, ranked number one in the country um, year after year. At my first debate tournament when I was 14, I was the highest ranked novice debater in the multi-state Mid-Hudson League. Since I'm obviously a narcissist, unable to resist taking pride in my championship dissing and debating skills, and since my adolescent power complexes are com quickly aroused by the schoolyard provocations of cyberbullies, it's hard for me to resist the pathetically amateur attempts of trolls to diss and debate me. Sure, I can win every time, but in doing so, I lose time and energy, and the troll wins the food of attention that they so desperately desire. So it's like that old bit of country wisdom. Don't wrestle with the pig. You'll both get dirty, but the pig likes it. And that concludes uh, this reading of Home is Where Your Timeline Is, a sci-fi word movie journey through the Facebook matrix. I jump copyright Jonathan Zapp of zapporacle.com and Reality Sandwich. Thank you so much.